seems that it would be good for our country to have young, bright students go to college here. Here in Oregon, it was stalled in the meeting. It was two votes away from getting on the floor for a vote. It passed the Senate floor. And he got stalled in the committee. So uh, that's where it got right at the end of the session. So basically, this, along with a lot of other discussions, we'll leave that for But we're moving on. We're going to reintroduce it. Do we know the names of the committee people? Oh, yeah. We did a sit in. So we're just going to start having a dialogue, engaging these uh, uh, people that said we need a, we want this to be moving forward. So it didn't end there, it stopped there. It did not end Respond to the concern that there is this rate of increasing wealth disparity in this country, and I'm wondering if there's a, a project to uh, an idea to, to start reversing it in the other direction before before we have no more assets of our own. Right now, we have the lowest income tax rate in the last 60 years. Right, the lowest income tax rate in the last 60 years. That doesn't help you and I. It helps corporations. It helps the rich. We have a, right now we have, we're projected to have a, what is it, $1.27 trillion deficit. That's what the received deficit crisis was over. But the Bush track tax, credit, tax cuts, all by itself, accounts for $1.1 trillion. So if we did away with the Bush tax cuts, we would be well on our way to get a handle on this deficit. But let's be really clear here. We don't have a deficit. We do not have a short-term deficit crisis in this country. We have a short-term jobs crisis that makes the deficit worse. The problem we face today is creating jobs, and we're letting Washington, D.C., and my friend here, pop the hook. Off the hook. We should be just as militant as those folks who want to cut the deficit about jobs. And if you notice, they talk a big game about jobs, but what's the plan? We need a plan for jobs. Public transportation is vital to our community. It is vital to our planet. Transportation are green jobs. These are jobs that will lessen the carbon fiber that is produced by all of us. So the more people we get into transportation to get on the bus, we're saving our planet and we're creating jobs. Not only the jobs that are maintained and operated, but those who ride the transportation, our lowest income earners, <laughs> makes it affordable for them actually to get to work. So my question to Congressman Walden is where he does stand on the renewal of the tax, the gas tax, and how our communities can put forth the energy to see where we're at. Nobody wants to pay for taxes. Nobody wants to tax this increase, rather. But it's an important event is expanding. However, our transportation system, and it's not a perfect one we're working on, uh, needs to grow. And so, as we continue to move forward, I'm anxious and excited as we get more people involved, as, as it was talked about today and everybody getting together here tonight. I think it's extremely important. And we all have busy schedules, and when that sun is shining, it's, it's hard to get out of doing everything we're doing. But I think that's where the hard work takes place is all of us collectively working together. Thank you. Um, and what I'd really like to talk tonight about is uh, the Farm Bill. About every four years the Farm Bill comes up. Last Farm Bill was 2008, next one's 2012. Um, the representative has been uh, very active. Uh, he was very active in the 08 Farm Bill. Um, I don't want to call it pork, but uh, he did get a few special projects done. Those special projects may or may not have helped Oregon. Um, but overall, the Farm Bill in its current structure does not do much for Oregon. More importantly, the Farm Bill as it currently uh, is set up does not do much for us as Americans or even as humans. Uh, it, it has a significant impact globally. Um, 
It is basically a subsidy-based system. It's a subsidy-based system that does not help the family farmer, does not help farmers in, in, in general. It really shouldn't be called a farm bill. It should be called an industrial agriculture bill. Um, it basically supports the industrial agricultural complex. Um, not only uh, does it hurt small farms, uh, it also hurts people. Um, when we look at uh, our diabetes rates, when we look at our obesity rates, um, we can start to make some pretty serious correlations now um, with the two primary subsidized crops, which are corn and beans. Uh, less than 1% of that system goes to actual real food, food like what we would see as food, things like fruits and vegetables. Uh, majority of it goes to three food commodities and a couple of non-food commodities. My question for uh, the congressman is, um, what are you going to do with this new, food, with this new farm bill? We have an opportunity here to change the paradigm. We have an opportunity to get out of the kind of lazy fair business as usual, which just subsidizes uh, the Monsantos and the uh, big egg business. And uh, we have an opportunity to create jobs and uh, really bootstrap uh, our small agricultural base. So is this going to be business as usual, or uh, are you going to help us support uh, something that uh, would make things better? Again, he says it's not a problem in his district, and the statistics show otherwise. Um, one of the things that we have discovered with our work over the last three years is that the feds are taking a, basically, they're saying that they can't do anything because these are state laws. And so we've been working hard with our local state legislators and making, getting some good traction. What the feds can do is, is protect us um, in areas right now, the large Wall Street banks that are the servicers of these loans and foreclosing, and by the way, they are not the owners of the loans. And it is 46% more profitable for them to foreclose than to collect on a performing loan. This is sinful. And what they are not doing is protecting us from efforts to preempt our state laws, which is just so frightening to me that all of a sudden they're going to be creating some new federal laws that say the states have no rights in these areas. And this is one of my questions I would like to get to. And I'm challenging our senators as well on this issue. I wish I had a conversation with Walden on it, that if all of a sudden the feds can come in and tell us what to do in our state laws, What's amazing to me is that my friends on the right tell me that that is something that they are seriously opposed to, and yet we do not see any of them standing up for us on this matter. I came here tonight basically to talk about uh, immigration with you, Congressman Paul, because we're very concerned about it in this area. There are a number of us here, especially in Deschutes County, who are very concerned about both what is and is not happening in regard to our immigrant community. We're concerned about the lack on the federal level of work on compassionate and comprehensive immigration reform in Washington. This is what's not happening. What is happening is that we're seeing all kinds of deportations and all over the country, and especially right here in Deschutes County. And uh, this is even without the benefit of a program like Secure Communities, which it really makes them more less secure. Uh, which is a program that the government wants to implement all over the country by 2013. Our jail here in Deschutes County regularly turns over to ICE, Immigration Customs Enforcement, undocumented immigrants who were detained as a result of traffic stops. If you got a, tra a speeding ticket, you'd be taken to jail, held in jail, put on an ICE hold. And this is done even though it's not required by any kind of law. And the detentions and deportations have a lot of horrible effects on a lot of different people. Children are traumatized by the, use, the, the loss of a parent's parent. Parents, often breadwinners, are disappeared with no notice to anybody. Stranded family members are forced to rely on decreasing community resources. Community service providers, public and private, are being further burdened. Employers and the local economy bear the loss of dependable employees. And public safety suffers as fearful people avoid contact with law enforcement. We have
collected and analyzed data, data from the Deschutes County Adult Jail over a period of more than four years. And right here in this county, uh, we have imposed a, a total of almost 650 ICE holds or detainers on people over the past four full years. And during that period, 68% of those turned directly over to ICE from the Deschutes County Jail have had only minor criminal charges against them, if any. And this reflects the same percentages that are going on now through secure communities, even though ICE has as its stated purpose the removal of dangerous criminals. So we're very concerned about this. And uh, what happens is that when people are deported, uh, it weakens our country's families and economy and puts our community's future at risk. There's a new report, that's the same thing that I'm carrying here, I'm not going to go through the whole thing, uh, that was just released day before yesterday, declaring secure communities a failed program. It also states that local law enforcement's involvement in implementing ice holds is voluntary. If ICE concedes that our jails imposing of holds is voluntary, why does our sheriff do it? Collaborating flies in the face of common law enforcement sense and violates our common moral sense of compassion that we all have for our fellow human beings and their families. So we want you, Congressman Walden, to know that we need ways to build a strong economy here in Central Oregon. We need to regularize our immigrant labor force and provide a path to citizenship. We need to open the doors for immigrants to higher education. We depend on immigrant labor and must stop the current rate of deportations so that our community can live in harmony and peace. We want to follow a higher law that calls us to welcome the stranger, love our neighbor, and treat others as we would have them treat us. My questions to you, Congressman Walden, are what are you doing to help families whose parents and breadwinners are at risk of deportation? How will you work to eliminate federal programs that terrorize our immigrant community? And the bottom line for you as our congressional representative there in Washington is what would you do to promote compassionate, comprehensive immigration reform that will benefit all who live and work and raise their families in your district. Uh, Congressman Walden, why do you always vote against the people and for corporations? Why aren't you representing us? <laughs> Please, <laughs> if you like. Yeah. Um, I'm going to take it uh, as the place to be. Uh, Y'all watch the stock market. Dropping is dropping, is dropping. And it seems we're in an economic and global slowdown. You know, we were here in 1937. 1937, after the New Deal started putting people back to work, all of a sudden the New Dealers uh, became, and businesses became concerned about the deficit. And they started reining in spending. And within six months, within six months, industrial productivity dropped 40%, and the stock market dropped 48%, and they went back into a recession, and they didn't emerge from that recession until three years later, World War II. That's exactly what the Congress is putting this nation into, is a downhill slide, because they're not increasing productivity. They're not creating the jobs to put folks back to work. So, if Congressman Walden really wants to turn this country around, we'd be doing things like investing in infrastructure and passing the Transportation Reauthorization Act that would build bridges and light rail and more demand for the streetcar, the only U.S. manufactured streetcar, where? Right, Clackamas, Oregon. That's the type of thing we should be doing in this country to get us moving again, but it's not happening. Uh, before the crash of the economy, uh, my wife and I operated a successful micro business with no debt except for our mortgage. And in that, we had 45% equity. Um, just a few years away from retirement, we had a plan. We had cash reserves. We had an IRA built. We had pensions built. 
we were in good position for retirement. Uh, I had a personal trust in the integrity of the financial system. I trusted the bankers, and I always trusted the bankers through my whole career. They've been through ups and downs. So when the economy crashed, what I did was lobby with my wife to say, we'll keep this going. We'll use our cash reserves. We did that. We dug into using our lines of credit through credit cards and other lines of credit. We used that up. We dug into our IRA at my direction. Um, we'll take responsibility for it and borrow from family members. Uh, all of this didn't solve the problem. Uh, the economy was not going to turn around. So when the economy crashed and TARP was announced to bail out the banks, um, I called up the bank that we made our payments to and asked for help. I was told that we can't help people who are current. To get any opportunity for help, you have to be 90 days in default. So, you know, thinking this is right, but we went ahead and did it. Then came the foreclosure notice. So, uh, we were applying for a modification at the same time, it got foreclosed on. We challenged it, they canceled it. We found some legal reasons that we challenged them on. They canceled the foreclosure. They came back with another foreclosure. We challenged that. Right now, we're in limbo. Um, so, our current situation, our credit's destroyed. Uh, no job, no insurance, depleted reserves, and retirement is deflated. Uh, my question to Congressman Walton is, what can you do to assure me that the rule of law is going to protect me uh, in this situation and let me seek my legal remedies. Thank you, Mark. That's my husband. <laughs> uh, that's my story too. And uh, uh, point out a couple of things. We're my we were micro business, and, and a couple of we, we talk about labor. We talk about creating jobs. The average small business in rural America employs three people. And you think, well, that's not a lot, but there's millions of those. And we talk about unemployment like in Southern Oregon or here in, in this region. We're looking at about 12%. It's really about 30% because Mark Thomas and Nancy Kerber and millions of us will never show up on the unemployment rolls because we're small business. We can't collect unemployment. Our voice isn't heard. We aren't recognized. It's a serious problem. So when they say 12%, it is not 12%. When you get to the age we're at, no one will hire us because we are a risk for insurance. We've got a collapsing situation here. So we've got multiple issues that compound. We went in to get that mod wonderful modification. And how many of you have heard about those wonderful modifications where they're going to help people? They got the trillions of dollars with the bailouts, and now they're going to help people. It is the biggest scam that has ever hit America. Less than 1% of the people that apply get one. What they do is they get about somewhere closer to 30% of the people get what they call a trial modification. That's where they bleed you. They tell you three months, but we've seen them go on for two years when you're making these trial payments that are less than your original payment. They do not disclose to people those payments do not go towards your house, and you are in default and they double track you with foreclosure going on the side. And one day, sometimes, right in the middle of you making payments, you are being evicted from your house. So when you're talking to people that are going through this and they think they got a lot, they probably got the shit. And um, what we've seen legislative efforts, even in the state, are that let's try and get these guys to play fair. Well, they don't own our loans, they're not going to play fair. They're making a killing. You think they made money on the way up? They're making far more money on the way down. They're making a fortune off of our poverty. You know, I could go on for four hours. I won't. But it, um, the modifications, that whole program is totally dysfunctional. You'll hear it called the HAMP Act. We call it the HAMP Act. We're not sure what they're smoking. But it's not serving your neighbors, you, your family. And what we have found is that about 95% of the foreclosures going on in the state of Oregon are illegitimate. 
and with a small amount of pushback, the majority of us can get some service traction, put them in limbo, cost them money, cost them grief, and make them come to the table. A lot of our homeowners are getting quiet workouts now that their schedule is on. But you get them in the corner, that's when they come to the table. And I'm so sad that the congressmen and others are looking the other way. I wish they would come and talk with us. Uh, I'm Linda O'Donnell, the president of the Great Oregon Area Local American Postal Workers Union. And my question to Walden is, there, the Postal Service is under attack. And Washington discusses job growth. How does putting more people in the unemployment line by closing post offices and processing plants help job growth? There's a disconnect in this nation that somehow a public sector job, whether it's a federal level or a local government or state government, is somehow less than, somehow it doesn't impact the economy. A job's a job. You take, you get rid of postal workers or you cut teachers, not only do you impact that service, but you're taking that money out of the economy. Economy, the money that we need to keep things rolling. So these layoffs are making things worse, not better. As my Democratic representatives of Congress, how are you protecting the democracy from progressive domination of our government by corporations and super rich interests? My opinion, co panelists keep telling me to take that question, and um, I have no new brilliance to add an insight on that per se, but I do think the question remains um, around one, who's paying your bills? Two, what are the choices that are, who, you being Walden, Congressman Walden, what are the choices that you're making? And um, we have a couple of examples that just look at, you know, how he is voting. Uh, it's one thing he's voting against reforming unjust immigration laws in the United States and further requesting what we could call undocumented ref economic refugees. And I think um, some folks at this table could talk a lot to trade. But at the same time, voting to defund and neuter the enforcement of arm of security and exchange commission, which is charged with investigating financial fraud on Wall Street. So again, what are the choices that are being made? And um, how do we... Uh, create a little bit of fire around saying, you know what, if you are concerned about security, which is what you keep saying with these immigration laws, why are you in fact not paying attention to security when it's the large corporations that are going to be most impacted and Wall Street be most impacted? I, I do. Um, I'm kind of you. Um, remember when I told you that how the contributions broke down per party, there's really not a difference between where corporate money goes. They're trying to buy the system. And what you're, what you're seeing from organized labor is a new way of doing things. Given, we'll never, as a union movement, we'll never be able to keep pace with corporations. Never. And when we give big dollars to candidates, what happens is we get elected, and then they kick us to the curb on trade, right? Yes. Right? And because they're corporate cronies, the folks that gave them the money, they're pushing them. The reason I'm here tonight is for you, but it's also for this. It's, also, it's about building power because our current political system isn't working. And it's dominated by corporations, it's bought by corporations, and you see the mess we're in because of it. We have to, as a people, <coughs> like-minded, aggressive people, come together, plan events. It's not easy. We have different cultures, but it's going to pay off. And this is what we got to do to win. And we got to win. Um, I guess I can really talk about both the jobs and foreclosures, but I'm from both. Um, since I've been in construction for 38 years, uh, especially a contractor, and when the economy dropped and my business went um, very, very slow in, in work, first thing I tried to do was work out something with the bank, went through the modification, which is a sham, and uh, then it squeezed me down to where I had two choices. One to give a deed in lieu, which would give a clear title, 
because if they foreclose in the state of Oregon, they get declined the title because it is illegal. Or fight back. I chose to fight back, and they foreclosed on my house two and a half hours before my son came home from Iraq. Uh, and that's part of the reason why I'm fighting back. I'm just one of thousands of people. My story is not that much different than a lot of people. But I'm in a position, I had three law firms want, want to take my case. And I picked one, and we're going to fight back. A lot of stuff they're doing is flat on you. And uh, there are options out there. Why is this allowed to happen? Why did the banks, why were they allowed to get too big to fail? Years back, big corporations got too big, they split them up. Why were they allowed to get too big to fail? Why were they giving our money to be bailed out? And then they foreclose on our home anyway. All the money seems to be going in one direction. For job creation, I'm trying to get my license back because people wanted me to go back and do their work again. The fees involved in doing that are almost prohibitive. Um, I found out just today, just to register my corporation name, my corporation's me, is $400. I don't have $400 to register my name so I can get my license so I can go back to work and pay taxes. It just seems that we're going in the wrong direction. The government wants all this money up front because they're trying to pay their bills and they're stymieing work to where we can pay taxes to give them the money. It's just kind of, they're looking at it in the wrong direction, in my opinion. Is. I know contractors try to get permits to do a job, ends up being tens of thousands of dollars just to remodel one room, which means they can't do it. It's cost prohibitive. Americans are nice, up to a point. And, uh, and when we get beyond that point, we're going to be in trouble. And it, it's up to groups like this to find constructive ways to get out and, and help people rebuild their sense of community because we've lost it. Our young people are having things happen to them that if they ever had a sense of community, it's being taken away. And it's up to this kind of group to get out and find innovative, clever ways, whether it's music or, or whatever, to, to get people together around so that we're not gathering around in a destructive way, but in a constructive way. Um, okay, um, I just want to wrap up that we've got a little display over here with a scarecrow. It's, we're creating some new characters who are taking out to the marketplace. A scarecrow's name is Scat. And, uh, and um, Scat is chasing, chasing the fat cat banker. And our slogan is Defending the Homestead. And we're going to be putting out a call to all of Oregon for homeowners to put up scarecrows, create scarecrows, find all kinds of creative ways. We're going to be making signs and things we can have all of our communities to start reframing the conversation. These fat cat bankers have done exactly what, what John just said back there. The Federal Reserve was just audited for the first time in its existence, and it was found that over $16 trillion of undisclosed money was funneled recently to the fat cat banks. It's unbelievable. So what we need to do is start getting people educated and having a conversation about the power of the person, what to do with your money, and changing the conversation from deadbeat homeowners, deadbeat workers, deadbeat union members, deadbeat Americans, to deadbeat that kind of members. Well, one of, the, one of the main things we do have to do is dialogue with them among, among each other and make welcome to community for all people in our community, be Latino, Asian, gay, straight, bisexual, anybody. We are a community, a diverse community. This community, this country was built on immigration, on people of this building walls between our communities right now is not, it's not going to work. I mean, we have to tear down those walls and have these conversations and not be afraid to discuss how we're going to, how we're going to come up with a solution together. And, it's, and yes, they do try to make a partisan issue, but it's not. It's about how we want our community to be. And it has to start here in, in our towns first. When we make this decision and we stand together, then we can go to the state and tell the state how we do it. And then they can go to the Fed. So we've got to start here and now and making those conversations and being together. I like this and uh, keep going with this. This is the beginning of something that 
It's going to be show our, our communities together, and we're going to get through this all together. Thank you. 